Let's pray and then we'll dive into Judges chapter 13. Lord, thank you for this time together in your house. We ask you to bless it. We ask, Lord, for you to open our ears and open our hearts to what we would need to hear and learn tonight, Lord. You're always so gracious to us. We thank you that you're like a fine surgeon who uses your word to cut the parts of our hearts that need surgery, Lord. And so we just pray you would do that in, in your gracious, wonderful way that you always do, because you love us, Lord. You love us so much that you send your son Jesus, and we thank you for your word. You would teach us and challenge us and help us and heal us and save us, Lord. We just love you. We thank you that you first loved us. And we commit this Bible study to you now in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. Well, as we come to chapter 13, we come to the last of the 12 judges who are mentioned in the book of Judges. When we get to 1 Samuel, you'll, you'll see uh, a couple of other judges that are mentioned. But in the book of Judges, there are 12, and we come to the last one. We come to Samson. Again, judges were not these black-robed uh, officials who sat behind a bench with a gavel. Uh, these are military leaders and heroes that God raises up for such a time uh, before the period of the monarchy when, when God acquiesced to their desire to have a king. It wasn't God's perfect will, but they wanted a king like the other nations around them. So before the uh, monarchy, God helps to rule and to reign over the people of Israel by way of a judge that he will raise up for the purpose of leading the people and fighting the enemies that come against Israel. This last judge mentioned here in the book of Judges is probably one of the most familiar, if not the most familiar of the 12 judges. His name is Samson. If you know his story, you know that he is physically strong, but he is morally weak. He is a he-man with a she-man problem. <laughs> and it's not just any women in particular, he goes after um, women who are part of the enemy camp. He has an attraction to the Philistine women. He has an attraction, you'll see, to prostitutes. So um, this, is a, this is an issue. He is physically strong, but he is morally weak. And um, we're going to see that as we read his story. Um, he's also spiritually weak. It's very interesting when you look at this guy's life. He's a very complex person. There are many people you're going to read about in the Bible. And, you know, last week's study with Japheth was probably one of those where you kind of scratch your head. and You go, how, how did God use a person like this? Because Samson, in addition to being physically strong and morally weak, was also spiritually weak. You never see him or hear about him praying. He never builds an altar. He never sacrifices to God. He never talks to a priest or a prophet. He is uh, extremely, to a fault, independent. He has no army. He has no friends. And yet this is the guy that God uses. He is very courageous. Uh, you'll notice just to highlight some things, in chapter 14, he tears a lion apart with his bare hands. Also in chapter 14, he kills 30 Philistine men from Ashkelon. In chapter 15, he captures 300 foxes. He ties their tails together. He lights them on fire and scurries them through the, the grain fields of the Philistines, setting the whole grain fields on fire. Also in chapter 15, he breaks ropes that bound him. He finds a fresh jawbone of a donkey, and he kills a thousand men using the, the jawbone of the donkey. And in chapter 16, the people of Gaza had trapped him in their city, and they're waiting to capture and kill him, and he simply goes to the locked gate of the city of Gaza, rips it off its hinges, throws it up over his shoulder, and walks up a mountain with it and dumps it off. So this is that kind of a he-man with a she problem. <laughs> And he's, you know, physically strong, morally weak, and spiritually weak also. But, you know, he lives a very courageous life, does a lot of courageous things for God. But sadly, if you're familiar with his story, he dies a very humiliating death. And this is the guy that God chooses to use. 
And God's going to use him in such an incredible way that Samson ends up making it in the list of the hall of faith in Hebrews chapter 11. He gets mentioned there as a man who had a lot of faith in following the Lord, which just goes to show you really that you can be a flawed person with some strengths and weaknesses, and yet God still sees fit to use us. And so as complicated as this guy is, as complex as he is, as duplicitous often as his life is, uh, this is a guy that God chose to use. So let's take a look at his story here. We'll get an introduction to it in through chapter 13 and um, hopefully through about half of chapter 14 today. So chapter 13, verse 1, again, the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord and the Lord delivered them into the hand of the Philistines for 40 years. So this is the cycle we've been looking at for the last many weeks that we've been through the book of Judges. This is the last time we're going to see this phrase that the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord. But again, this cycle indicates how they, things were going well with them as long as they were following after the Lord, where there was a judge who was ruling and kind of giving them leadership. They did well, but then, you know, there's a, a leader who dies and they fall into idolatry. They worship these pagan uh, gods of their neighboring nations. And then Israel sends their uh, enemies against them to oppress them. And that's what's happening here. So once again, after the death of the previous judges at the end of chapter 12, it mentions Ibzan and Elon and Abdon. There's this lull. And so during the lull, the people of Israel fall back into their old ways. They start worshiping these false gods, bowing down to these idols. And so God subjects them to the Philistines. The Philistines are the perennial enemies of the Israelites. And so here come the Philistines. Well, as they have been subjected now to 40 years of oppression by the Philistines, they again, the Israelites cry out to God and God's going to raise up Samson. So here we go. Verse two. Now there was a certain man from Zorah of the family of the Danites. So that tells us what tribe Samson belongs to, the tribe of Dan, whose name was Manoah. So this is Samson's father. And his wife, this is Samson's mother who was unnamed in the Bible. We don't know her name. Manoah and his wife, his wife was barren and had no children. And the angel of the Lord appeared to the woman and said to her, Indeed, now you are barren and have borne no children, but you shall conceive and bear a son. Now, therefore, please be careful not to drink wine or similar drink and not to eat anything unclean. For behold, you shall conceive and bear a son, and no razor shall come upon his head, for the child shall be a Nazarite to God from the womb, and he shall begin to deliver Israel out of the hand of the Philistines. All right, so pause there for a moment. So you're introduced here to Samson's parents, Manoah and his mom, who was unnamed. What we come to find out about his mom is that she's not been able to conceive uh, children. Uh, she's not the only one in the Bible. You have Hannah that God uses to bring forth Samuel. We'll read about her later. Uh, Elizabeth, uh, the, the mother of John the Baptist, in her old age, she conceives. And so this is not unique to uh, this one story here. You see that a few different places in the Bible where women are having difficulty having children. And then God comes along and opens their wombs, and then they bring forth a, a child that God uses. And this is one of those stories. And Samson is the only one of the 12 judges that, we've, that we learn about his life before he's even conceived. All the other judges were introduced to, the previous 11, we were introduced to as adults that God had chosen. But God goes all the way back in the story of Samson, and says, even before he was conceived, God had a purpose and a plan for this, for this man's life. And so the angel of the Lord appears to his mother. Now we're going to see here in the story that as often is the case, when you read that phrase, the angel of the Lord, particularly with the direct article, the, not just any ordinary angel, but the angel of the Lord, that this is none other than the Lord God himself who appears in the Old Testament by taking on human form. And so this is what's called a Christophany, an appearance of Christ. Before Jesus came, born of a virgin as God implanted by the Holy Spirit, 
his seed into the womb of Mary, that's when Jesus takes on flesh and comes in among us and dies for us. But Jesus has always existed, being co-eternal and co-equal with God. And there are times in the Old Testament before Jesus enters into the human race through Mary that Jesus appears and Jesus appears being referred to as the angel of the Lord. Now we're going to see later in the story how we know more clearly that it really is him. But for the moment, just kind of tuck that away that this is, this is the Lord who appears to Manoah's wife here and gives her this encouraging news that you're going to bear a son. And then she is told here by the Lord that he is to be a child that is dedicated to God by way of a Nazarite vow. And by the way, the Lord says to Samson's mother at the same time, you are to live by the same standard. So in effect, she is under a Nazarite vow also, at least for the duration of the pregnancy. We don't know that she was to live it out the rest of her life, but at least for the duration of the pregnancy, she was to take a Nazarite vow. For Samson, he was to live under a Nazarite vow for his entire life. So what is or who is a Nazarite? If you want to hang a left and go back to the book of Numbers, I'm going to read from Numbers chapter 6. The first eight verses where God explains exactly what the Nazarite vow is. Numbers chapter 6. First eight verses, this is what it says. And then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel and say to them, When either a man or a woman consecrates an offering to take the vow of a Nazarite, now notice this, this is the end of verse 2, to separate himself to the Lord. He shall separate himself from wine and similar drink. He shall drink neither vinegar made from wine nor vinegar made from similar drink, neither shall he drink any grape juice, nor eat fresh grapes or raisins. Verse 4, all the days of his separation, he shall eat nothing that is produced by the grapevine from seed to skin. All the days of the vow of his separation, no razor shall come upon his head until the days are fulfilled for which he separated himself to the Lord, he shall be holy." And then he shall let the locks of his hair of his head grow. All the days that he separates himself to the Lord, he shall not go near a dead body. He shall not make himself unclean, even for his father or his mother, for his brother or his sister, when they die, because the separation to God is on his head. All the days of his separation, he shall be holy to the Lord." So, back here in Numbers 13, who or what is a Nazarite? Well, in a phrase, it is someone who took a vow of separation from the world and dedication to God. That's what someone was considered who took a Nazarite vow. It was a, it was a consecration to the Lord and a separation from the rest of the world and worldly ways and there were three things in particular that one who took a Nazarite vow had to abide by. And so here they are. Um, number one, there was to be no eating or drinking anything from the grapevine. No wine, grapes, grape juice, raisins, anything from the grapevine. Now, it was mainly regarding anything fermented. But the entire grapevine was off limits to eliminate any possibility whatsoever of being intoxicated. That's why in number six, God was even specific to say, don't even eat the skins of the grapes. I don't, eat, I don't want you to even eat the skins. Like that's how much you're to avoid anything related to the grapevine because the real issue was don't go anything near that could potentially be intoxicating. If you're going to take this vow of separation, wine is off limits, anything related to the grapevine, period. No, no grape jelly, nothing. <laughs> the second thing that we read there in number six was no cutting of the hair. Now, the reason why they were told not to cut their hair was so that it would be a constant and regular reminder that they were under this vow. So it, you know, there was nothing particularly sacred about the hair itself. 
And by the way, even though if you know anything about Samson's story, that when his hair is cut, he suddenly becomes powerless, it's not that there was power in the hair. We'll talk more about it when we get to that part. This was simply an external sign that you were under a Nazarite vow. It was a reminder to you. It was, a, it was an indication to other people. Now, for ladies in particular, they may not notice you haven't cut your hair. But for men in particular in that culture, they would trim their hair. If you never trimmed your hair during the period of the vow, people would notice it was part of the Nazarite vow. And then thirdly, there was to be no contact with any dead body. The one under a Nazarite vow was not to go anywhere near a dead body. That's what number six, verse six said. Not even near. And it even said, you're excused from the funeral of your mother, father, brother, or sister, because you can't even go near them. And it was, again, all part of this idea of contamination. There's to be no intoxication, no contamination. So there's supposed to be separation uh, from the world, devotion unto God. Okay? So that's what all this is about, the Nazarite vow. Now, in the Bible, either a man or a woman could take a Nazarite vow. Most examples we have of Nazarite vows are men, but remember, Samson's mother was under the directive that she should be under a Nazarite vow, at least for the duration of the pregnancy. And the vow would be ended when you would cut your hair. When it was the end of your vow, when you were done, you would cut your hair, and that would be the end of the Nazarite vow period. Normally, the period of the vow was predetermined. Like you, would, you would decide you're going to be under a vow for, and if you look in the Jewish mission, the Jewish Mishnah, which is not in the Bible, it's just a Jewish, an ancient Jewish commentary on the Old Testament Scriptures. The Jewish Mishnah said typically a Nazarite vow was for 30, 60 uh, or a hundred days. So you would predetermine. You'd be like, you'd be like, you know what? I just want to kind of consecrate myself to the Lord. I've been living too much in the world. I'm going to take a Nazarite vow for the next 30 days, say. You wouldn't cut your hair. You wouldn't do anything related to the grapevine. You wouldn't go near dead bodies. You, and, and so you would be consecrated to the Lord. And, and, and you would determine that. It was something you could self-determine. I want to do a 60 day. I want to do a hundred day, whatever amount it was. Now, Samson was unique in that what God wanted of Samson was his entire life. For his entire life, not 30, 60, or 100 days, for his entire life, he is to be under a Nazarite vow. And what we're going to find out when we read through these chapters here is that he ends up violating, or at the very least, seriously compromising all the conditions of the vow that are supposed to separate him unto the Lord. So, this is his story. Let's keep reading. Verse 6. So the woman came, this is Samson's mother, and told her husband, saying, A man of God came to me, and his countenance was like the countenance of the angel of God. Very awesome. But I did not ask where he was from, and he did not tell me his name. And he said to me, Behold, you shall conceive and bear a son. Now drink no wine or similar drink, nor eat anything unclean, for the child shall be a Nazarite to God from the womb to the day of his death. And then Manoah prayed to the Lord and said, O oh my Lord, please let the man of God whom you sent come to us again and teach us what we shall do for the child who will be born. And so, you know, so Mrs. Manoah, we'll call her Mrs. Manoah because she's got no name here. So Mrs. Manoah comes to Manoah and says, you're never going to believe this. I was out in the fields. This angel of the Lord appeared to me and I don't even know where he's from. I didn't even get his name, but he said, I'm going to have a baby. We're going to have a baby. And he's to be under a Nazarite vow. And Manoah goes, did you get anything more out of him? No, I didn't get anything more of a, an address, an email, something, nothing. I didn't get anything. Twitter, something, nothing. I didn't get a thing. So, he, so then he starts praying, oh, God, I want to see this guy. You know, I, I want to hear for myself. Would you please cause him to reappear? Well, verse 9 says, and God listened to the voice of Manoah. And the angel of God came, but look, not to, not to Manoah. The angel of God came to the woman again as she was sitting in the field. But Manoah, her husband, was not with her. And then the woman ran in haste and told her husband and said to him, Look, look, the man who came to me the other day has just now appeared to me. So Man Manoah arose and followed his wife. And when he came to the man, he said to him, Are you the man who spoke to this woman? 
<laughs> now that, that seems like that's not, not very kind. Do you speak to this woman? Uh, you know, you would normally say, do you speak to my lovely wife? <laughs> do you speak to this woman? But that's just a cultural thing he's, he's doing there. And he said, I am. That's kind of interesting, right? He's the great I am. You see here a revelation of who this angel is. We'll see it even further in a moment. And Manoah said, now let your words come to pass. What will be the boy's rule of life and his work? So like, give me a little instruction. How am I going to raise this kid? We've never had any kids. I'm not sure what to do. They don't come with an instruction manual. I'm really desperate here. What's going to be the rule of this kid's life? And what will he end up doing? What will be his work? What's going to be his career here? Okay. This is like a good dad asking those kind of questions, right? And so, verse 13, so the angel of the Lord said to Manoah, of all that I said to the woman, let her be careful. She may not eat anything that comes from the vine, nor may she drink wine or similar drink, nor eat anything unclean. All that I commanded her, let her observe. And then Manoah said to the angel of the Lord, please let us detain you and we will prepare a young goat for you. So it's like stay for dinner. You know, we, we want to learn more. So, that, you know, they're excited about this. And, and so it's not every day like the Lord shows up, you know, and, and so he's like, we want to we want to cook dinner for you. We'll prepare a young goat. And it says in verse 16 that the angel of the Lord said to Manoah, Though you detain me, I will not eat your food. But if you offer a burnt offering, you must offer it to the Lord. Notice, for Manoah did not know he was the angel of the Lord. So it's interesting. So the Lord says here, I'm not going to eat your food. Thank you very much for your hospitality. I'm not going to stay for dinner. But you can make a burnt offering. If you want to sacrifice a burnt offering to the Lord, it says, verse 17, Then Manoah said to the angel of the Lord, What is your name, that when your words come to pass, we may honor you? And the angel, here we go, And the angel of the Lord said to him, Why do you ask my name, seeing it is wonderful? Isaiah 9, 6. And his name shall be Wonderful. Counselor, mighty God, everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. He's just revealed who he is in that statement right there. Why do you want to know my name? My name is wonderful. That's Isaiah 9, 6. So he is revealing himself as the Lord, as the great I Am. And so Manoah took the young goat with the grain offering and offered it upon the rock to the Lord, to the Lord, and he did a wondrous thing while Manoah and his wife looked on. Look at this. It happened as the flame went up toward heaven from the altar, the angel of the Lord ascended in the flame of the altar. And when Manoah and his wife saw this, they fell on their faces to the ground. And when the angel of the Lord appeared no more to Manoah and his wife, then Manoah knew that he was the angel of the Lord. And Manoah said to his wife, now this is even more clear, look at this, we shall surely die, he thinks, because we have seen God. Elohim is the word in the Hebrew right there for God. So he knows this is no ordinary angel of the Lord. This is a pre-incarnate appearance of Jesus. This is God who's taken on human form to appear to them. And so Manoah is afraid they're going to die. He says, because we have seen God. We have seen Elohim. But his wife here is the voice of reason. She says in verse 23, she says to him, now if the Lord, now she uses his proper name. This is Yahweh right there. If the Lord, if Yahweh had desired to kill us, he would not have accepted a burnt offering and a grain offering from our hands, nor would he have shown us all these things, nor would he have told us such things as these at this time. You know, she, so he's like, I think we're going to die. We just saw God. She's like, if we were going to die, he would have killed us by now. Like we just had him for dinner, you know, and, and he didn't want to eat the food, but he offered, we offered a sacrifice to him. That would have kind of been the time for, for him to kill us if he really wanted to kill us. Now, listen. There's something not said here that I think is important to point out. And this is a little, I don't know, um, maybe a little counseling moment for some of you married couples, okay? <laughs> he says something there out of fear. And she doesn't jump all over him and be like, you mamsie, come on, man up. <laughs> Who's this for? I don't know. But it's like, it, she doesn't shame him. She doesn't say, man up, come on, what do you mean we would die? She's just like, no, let's just think this through. Let's be reasonable. And she reasons with him. But she doesn't shame him. 
She doesn't. She's just like, no, just think this through. And he's like, okay, all right, you're right. That's just for somebody at no extra cost. I don't know who that's to. <laughs> and so, verse 24, so the woman bore a son and called his name Samson. Now, Samson in Hebrew means sonny. Now, not S-O-N-N-Y, not like Sonny Jurgensen, like, hey, Sonny boy, not Sonny, but S-U-N-N-Y. And I wonder if, she, if they've named him Sonny because of how the Lord appeared to them and then in the fire of the altar, just kind of, you know, as he was, uh, you know, lit up and illuminated, the Lord rose. And so we're going to remember this moment. We're going to call our kid Sunshine, you know, Sonny. And so that's his name. That's what Samson means. And the child grew and the Lord blessed him. And the spirit of the Lord began to move upon him at Mahane Dan, which just translates the camp of Dan, between Zorah and Eshtaol. Now let's read a little bit into chapter 14. We're not going to get too far here because we're going to run out of time. But I want you to notice between chapter 13 and 14, there's about a 20 year gap. Because we're, we, we see that he's born at the end of chapter 13, and now into chapter 14, he wants a wife, and it is believed he's about 20 years of age now. So chapter 14, verse 1 says, Now Samson went down to Timnah and saw a woman in Timnah of the daughters of the Philistines. Here we go. The Philistines are the enemies. The Philistines are the ones who have been oppressing the Israelites for 40 years. And he goes down and he sees a woman, a daughter of the Philistines. So he went up and told his father and mother, saying, I have seen a woman in Timnah of the daughters of the Philistines. Now, therefore, get her for me as a wife. Does this sound a little entitled right there? It's like your boss and mom and dad around, like, get me a wife. Sounds like a middle school kid wanting an iPhone. What are you, you're just like, what are you telling us? Like, we don't, we don't take orders from you. He's going to tell them twice in the same chapter, a few verses later, get me this woman. Well, verse 3, and says, Then his father and mother said to him, Is there no woman among the daughters of your brethren, among the Israelites, or among all my people, that you must go and get a wife from the uncircumcised Philistines? Now, this is a great question that they're asking him. They're like, you know, aren't there any women here among the Israelites? You got to go picking a woman from among the Philistines who are these pagan, worshiping, wicked people who don't honor God, don't worship God. You really want one of those women among the Philistines is a very important question. Because here he is, you know, that you begin to see him, you know, moved by the flesh. He's not really thinking. You know, he's just more moved by the flesh. And let me tell you something, if you want to honor God, especially when it comes to relationships, you better be looking for someone who shares the same values and beliefs and has a relationship with Jesus like you do. Because if you, you know, for some of you right now, this is again, free information for some of you who are like, you see some sizzling hot Philistine where you work. And you're like, yeah, but Pastor G, you don't know what a nice person this guy is. He's really nice. Uh, He's just so nice. He's just really sizzling hot Philistine. Yeah. And so I just want to, you know, flirt to convert. No. (laughs) No. Don't flirt to convert. Put up a wall so you don't fall. That's what you need to be doing. (laughs) Right? (laughs) Put up a wall so you don't fall. Don't be flirting to convert. And, you know, that's not, the, that's not, that's missionary dating, right? And so, and so the father and mother asking him a good question. is like, why do you want to get tangled up with this girl? She doesn't worship the same God. She doesn't believe the, the same things we do. As the Bible teaches this kind of thing, right? 2 Corinthians 6, 14, not being unequally yoked. A believer and a non-believer in a relationship is not a good thing. And so he repeats it after they ask him that question. At the end of verse 3, he repeats, and Samson said to his father, Get her for me, for she pleases me well. All right, look at verse 6, or the next verse. What is that? Verse uh, 4. But his father and mother did not know that it was of the Lord that he was seeking an occasion to move against the Philistines, for at that time the Philistines had dominion over Israel. Now wait, now wait, right there. Some of you are going to go, well, there's the verse right there. It's okay to date that that non-believer. That's missionary dating right there. It's in the Bible. Okay, look. You know, it's also in the Bible that God told Hosea the prophet to marry a prostitute. That doesn't mean a principle. That just was a one-off. And there was a reason why God told Hosea to do that, because Gomer was a picture of Israel. She had prostituted herself by following other gods, was 
was committing sexual immorality in that sense, was like committing adultery, going after another lover instead of loving God. And so God said to the prophet Hosea, as a symbol to the nation, I want you to marry a prostitute so that they will know that despite their unfaithfulness, I still love them. And you're going to love that prostitute as a picture of my love for the people who have committed spiritual adultery against me. Okay, there are one-off times where God says, do this and do that. That doesn't create a principle or a pattern for us to follow. This is not a principle or a pattern for us to follow here. But in fact, God was going to allow Samson to marry, and even that is disputed because when you look at the chapter, it seems to indicate that they have the feast for the marriage, but they don't consummate it. And by the end of chapter 14, God gives the woman, check this out if you don't think this is painful, God ends up giving the woman to Samson's best man. Yeah, ouch. So, it's not even clear if he actually consummated the marriage with her. She's going to be referred to as his wife in this chapter, but in the same way that when, they were, when people were betrothed, when Mary and Joseph were betrothed, before they came together, they were considered under that custom as husband and wife, and it was binding even though they had not yet consummated the marriage. So, there's some different aspects of marital relationships in the scriptures compared to the way it is today. So we're not even sure that he ended up consummating the marriage with her and only perhaps went through the part of the feast ceremony. But regardless, God has allowed it here because he's going to set up the Philistines. It's all part of God's eventual defeat here, the Philistines. But so I want you to notice now, it says, we'll just read a little bit further here. So verse five, so Samson went down to Timnah with his father and mother and came to the vineyards of Timnah. Now, wait a minute. Look at our list. No eating, drinking, anything from the grapevine. What are you doing dancing in the vineyards? Why are you hanging out in the vineyards? Well, it's a good question, you see, because these are slow indications of compromise. And so he's, he comes to the vineyards of Timnah. It says, now to his surprise, a young lion came roaring against him, and the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon him, and he tore the lion apart as one would have torn apart a young goat. Well, I find that funny, don't you? I don't, read that slowly, just like, you want to you know how he did this? You want to know how he tore a young lion apart? The same way you tear a young goat apart, that's how. <laughs> Okay, all right, I get it now. Yeah, because I'm, I'm, I'm shredding goats all the time. So now I, I understand what, he's, what, that, what that is. And it says, though he had nothing in his hands. This is just his bare hands. He's ripping this lion apart. But he did not tell his father or his mother what he had done. Why do you suppose he didn't want to tell mom or dad? Because any guy who just ripped a lion apart with his bare hands would want everybody to know. So why didn't he want to tell them? Because he's in the vineyards when it happened. And you don't want to tell mom and dad, hey, I just, I just tore this lion apart. Really? Where did that happen? Well, I was, uh, uh, never mind. You know, because he's not supposed to be in the vineyards. He's not supposed to be hanging out there. You're getting, you're getting dangerously close. He is a picture of someone who just kept pressing the envelope, getting right up to the edge until eventually it's going to all lead to a very humiliating death. So he had no business being in the vineyards. So now he's not going to tell anybody what he's done here with this lion. It's recorded for us, but he doesn't tell his mom or dad. Verse 7, then he went down and talked with the woman. This is the woman that he's attracted to. And she pleased Samson well. After some time, when he returned to get her, he turned aside to see the carcass of the lion. Okay, this is the same lion. So sometime later he goes back. There's the carcass of the lion. What's number three on the list? You're not supposed to be around a dead body. That's not just a human being. That's any carcass. That's any animal. Anything that was dead. Now he's around the carcass, and behold, it says, a swarm of bees and honey were in the carcass of the lion. Okay, so during the time, I mean, you know, bees will make a, a nest uh, wherever they jolly well please. It seems kind of weird to be inside, you know, the, the dead carcass of a lion, but that's where they decide to make this hive. And, uh, and there's honey now inside 
the carcass of this lion. What does Samson do? Verse 9, he took some of it in his hands and went along eating. And when he came to his father and mother, he gave some to them and they also ate. But he did not tell them that he had taken the honey out of the carcass of the lion. Here we go again. Now, there's two reasons here why he didn't tell them that he took the honey out of the carcass of the lion. Number one, because point number three on our list, you're not supposed to be around a dead body. So you have to imagine with great dexterity, Samson's like, okay, I'm going to roll up my sleeve and I'm just going to, I can't touch this dead body. I'm not even really supposed to be near it. But as long as I don't like, you know, really touch the dead body, just want to get a little bit of this honey. And so that he takes this honey out with him. Okay, so that's one reason you don't want to tell mom or dad, because that's a violation number three on the list. The other reason you don't want to tell mom and dad as they're eating it, you got it out of a dead carcass. Who wants to eat honey out of a dead carcass? That's not the most appetizing thing. Do you know what I'm saying to you? So he doesn't tell mom or dad. What a picture this is, though, isn't it? of somebody who's just playing with fire. It's like, I know I'm not really supposed to be here. I know I'm not supposed to be near this dead body, but there's something really sweet. I don't care how sweet something looks, if it violates your relationship with the Lord, it's never worth it. It's never worth it. And many of us have learned the hard way. We thought it was so sweet. Oh, in the moment it was. But anything that looks sweet, that interferes in our relationship with the Lord, is never worth it. No matter how tasty it looks, no matter how enticing it seems to be, it is never worth it. Just a couple more verses. And so his father went down to the woman, and Samson gave a feast there. For young men used to do so. Well, they still do. It's called a bachelor party. (laughs) And it happened when they saw him that they brought 30 companions to be with him. Of course, I mean, if you're going to have a bachelor party, you you have no problem drumming up 30 other friends who want to come and drink with you. This is a drinking feast. This is what's happening here. Now, he's not supposed to be. It doesn't say that he actually drank, but he's around it. He's around The alcohol, he's around the carcass, he's in the vineyards. I mean, this guy is just, you know, one little compromise after another, after another, after another. We're going to close there because the next verse, he starts into a riddle. So we'll talk about the riddle next week. But I I just want to, I've referred to this this story before, but I'm just going to repeat it again because we're at a place here where it talks about these little compromises, these little tiny compromises, little compromise. What can it do? What can be the great damage? On February the 1st, 2003, the Space Shuttle Columbia disintegrated upon re-entry to Earth from outer space, killing all seven crew members on board. And it was later determined that a small piece of foam insulation had broken off during takeoff, resulting in a small six-inch gouge to the underside of Columbia's left wing. And upon re-entry to Earth, that small gouge allowed hot atmospheric gases to penetrate and destroy the internal wing structure. And when that happened, everything else disintegrated. A 230,000-pound aircraft, 122 feet long, 56 feet high, with a wingspan of 78 feet, all disintegrated because of a small six-inch tear that compromised the entire thing. It's not usually the big things that bring us down. It's the little compromises along the way. If nothing else, tonight and the next couple of weeks that we look at the life of Samson, let his story be a warning to all of us. None of us is exempt. Any of us can fall. The little compromises is what opens the door, is what exposes our weaknesses, and eventually the whole thing disintegrates. So we have to guard our lives and guard our hearts The sweet things aren't always as sweet as they appear. They're often very damaging to our lives. So may Samson serve, if nothing else, to be a warning to us and a reminder. We're all weak and we all need to be strong in the Lord and stay close to him. Amen. Let's pray tonight. We'll pick it up there next week. Lord, thank you for this time and your word. Continue to use your word to speak to our hearts and to shape us and to mold us to be more like Jesus. 
when we hear and read about the story of Samson, may it remind us all that little compromises can bring about a great fall. And we don't want to be numbered among those who fall, Lord. For those who already have, we thank you for forgiveness and grace. But as a warning to those who haven't, may we be strong in the Lord and in your mighty power. May we not think of ourselves too highly or think to ourselves that we would never fall in the way that that person did or this person did because none of us is exempt. We all need to be mindful that we're frail, we're but dust, we're flesh. Lord, and any of us, given the right circumstances, can fall into any kind of sin. So guard our hearts, Lord, and help us to stay strong in the Lord. And thank you for stories like Samson that can remind us and warn us in advance. We love you, Lord, and we thank you for your love toward us. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, amen.